So welcome to today's uh, session. Um, Federal Highway Administration has a history of supporting um, improving the quality of environmental documentation. Um, some of you probably remember that from uh, EDC2. Um, IQED su uh, supports um, telling the story of the project, keeping the document brief, and ensuring that the documentation meets all legal requirements. But no good document can be produced without a good process. So for EDC3, we've combined the IQED initiative with eNEPA um, to help develop that process. Each of these tools helps different aspects of the project development process, but both of them have the same goal, which is in the end, uh, producing uh, a more efficient project development process with better outcomes. So today, um, I'm gonna take you through uh, an introduction to our eNEPA tool, and then I'm gonna hand it off um, to Owen and Dan, who are going to discuss uh, improving the quality of environmental documents and what that means for EDC3. So my name is Bill Ostrom. Uh, I'm an environmental protection specialist at the Federal Highway Administration in the Office of Project Development and Environmental Review. Um, and I've been on the ENIPA team um, since the beginning, uh, about two and a half years ago when we first started uh, research and development of the tool. Um, so today I'm going to uh, briefly take you through um, what ENIPA is, uh, what are some of the benefits, give you some updates on some recent developments in the tool. Um, I know some of the states who are here today were some of our kind of pilot states and our early adopters, um, and there have been some changes even since that time. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, Everyday Counts 3 and what our, our goals are for implementing eNEPA. Uh, so what is eNEPA? eNEPA is a web-based tool, meaning that there's nothing to download in, or install. Users can access just uh, by going to the website, using a username and password, and can access their project information from anywhere at any time. It's designed for interagency collaboration. Um, any project partners can access and use the tool from federal, state, and local agencies, uh, and including contractors. And then it's uh, a project development tool. You'll see a lot of the features um, that I'm going to talk about in a minute are really meant to make it easier for your project manager to manage the project development process and for your project partners to participate. And then finally, it's designed uh, primarily for EA and EIS projects. So while these uh, projects are, might make up a, a small percentage of your overall programs, um, they're often the projects that require the most collaboration. So that's where we focused uh, in developing the tool initially. So um, the NEPA process um, looks pretty simple on paper, um, but as we all know, it can get complex pretty quickly. Um, you'll often have multiple reviews from multiple project partners. Um, changing deadlines, uh, organization of comments and meetings, um, and all of that's even when the project development process is going smoothly. Um, if you add in some, some personnel changes um, and things like that, it can get even more complex um, and more time consuming. So eNEPA is meant to make this process a little bit easier um, for the project managers and for all of the project partners. Um, it does this through maintaining easy documentation um, and some automated organization features that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, it supports concurrent reviews by multiple agencies. Um, so instead of kind of that sequential uh, review process in series where you have to have each agency do their review, combine your comments, um, and then try to um, reach a mu mutual resolution at the end, we're going to talk about some features that are going to help uh, let all of those agencies review documents at the same time so that you're, you're not having those serialized discussions. Um, and then finally, real-time document and comment sharing, making sure that all of these resources are available to your project team uh, just in time for those reviews. So um, eNEPA provides easy documentation and organization. Um, what you see on the screen here is an example of uh, about half of one of our project workflows. Um, all of the information in the tool is going to be organized according to those basic steps, either in the EA um, or EIS process. 
Um, so you see that we can start all the way back in planning, allowing you to incorporate some of those early planning documents, give your team access to that information um, so that it can be incorporated into later decision making, um, and then take you all the way through either your, your FONSI or your ROD. Um, ENIPA allows, um, allows you to upload any documents, not just those kind of major steps you see in the workflow, um, but the main organization system is based around those big steps. Um, and what that allows you to do is maintain that organization um, kind of automatically for easy reference later in the process. Um, there are also a number of features that allow your project manager um, to really uh, dig in and um, produce that uh, project record, which is going to be useful uh, not just during later project development, but during uh, design and construction later. Um, you can associate any document with any of those steps. Uh, you can uh, determine whether it's kind of a draft or a final document that you want to carry forward. Um, and you can restrict access within your project team, uh, meaning that there are some documents that the whole project team is going to want access to, and there's some that uh, maybe the state DOT alone is going to work off of. Um, ENIPA also helps facilitate a lot of the actions that uh, your project manager is normally responsible for, um, such as maintaining uh, a collection of uh, these ever-changing deadlines that I was talking about a little while ago. Um, when your project team is asked to review a document, um, they'll receive an email asking them not only to um, kind of officially accept that review offer, uh, but to um, determine if the review date is something that they're going to be able to achieve. Um, all of that information then is going to be automatically tracked in ENIPA. Um, you can see along the bottom there, um, in this case an alternatives analysis review, that all the members of your project team who are involved in that review um, can easily see who's still working on their review, um, if they've completed it when they've concurred and agreed to move on to the next step. Um, and that is extremely helpful for promoting accountability, not just among uh, the resource agencies, but among the action agencies as well. It also can help simplify concurrent agency reviews. Um, as you can see here, uh, the documentation in eNEPA um, can be divided up not just among kind of your major documents, but you can assign reviews based on individual pieces of those documents. Um, so for example, some mem members of your project team um, might be involved uh, only in the air quality analysis or only in the archaeological analysis, and eNEPA allows you to make those assignments individually. Um, it also allows for real-time document and comment sharing. Um, you know, one of the um, kind of choke points in the process is often that you know, we have to wait for new versions of documents to be sent around. Somebody might, uh, might not have received an email and reviewed the, the wrong version of the documents. ENIPA allows the project managers to instantaneously give access to those documents to the whole project team, making sure that everybody uh, has access to those documents. You don't have to worry about something getting um, sent to your junk folder or um, filling up your inbox. All of those documents are available anytime through, directly through the tool. Um, ENIPA also has kind of two um, main ways to share comments. Uh, one is by just uploading and, and uh, downloading documents, as I've kind of mentioned. Um, users can go in if, if you have kind of detailed comments, a redlined version of a document. Any member of your project team can upload that back to the tool and allow your other agencies to work off of that new version of the document so you don't have to deal with those repetitive comments. And what you see on the screen here is also an example of our internal commenting feature um, that's really based more along those discussion points where multiple agencies need to hash out a mutual solution to a problem. And again, all of these documents and comments are automatically tracked in the tool um, to help you build the project record going forward and also to allow you to give access to that past decision making when new members of your project team join so that they can see not just what decisions were made in the past, but why those decisions were made. ENIPA also automatically tracks the schedule of your project. Um, this is an example of a uh, project calendar, and you can see that all of the dates associated with the project in the tool, whether those are meetings, um, due dates, uh, dates final versions of documents were uploaded, 
All of that information is easily tracked in the tool, and that calendar tab can give you a, a quick kind of snapshot of what recent deadlines you've hit and what deadlines are coming up. Again, this can help promote accountability across the project team as all of that information is easily accessible uh, across agencies. Um, ENIPA also allows project team members to um, export any of this to their uh, calendars. Um, the little calendar icon on the right there um, will send the user a, an Outlook or uh, Google Calendar um, compatible calendar invitation. So if they choose to track that on their own, um, they're able to do so. So those are kind of the, the basic functions built into the tool. Um, as part of our EDC rollout, um, we're, we're happy to provide a kind of detailed walkthrough of the tool to any state agencies and, and Federal Highway Division offices that would like one and provide some basic training um, on how to use those features for maximum benefit. Um, but just very briefly, I'd like to talk about some of the major benefits we see in using those features. Um, so better accountability, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, providing that automated tracking, um, providing that information across the project team uh, helps everybody understand not just where their deadlines are, but where everyone else's is. Um, ENIPA, ENIPA allows users to agree to deadlines so that all that information is tracked. And when deadlines have to be moved, ENIPA also tracks that information um, for later reference. Um, faster issue resolution, um, that's really tied in across the tool. Um, a lot of the, uh, the access features and the internal commenting features are really designed to help promote faster issue, issue resolution across multiple agencies. Reduce mailings, obviously. Um, as, as I mentioned before, uh, ENIPA can help replace some of those mailed documents and emailed documents that often um, need to be sent back and forth and can result in delays in the project development process. Um, better quality documents. Um, Owen and Dan are going to talk a little bit more about, uh, about this in the second half of our presentation. Um, but eNEPA, combined with IQED, um, really aims to produce a better quality document um, that's going to be more effective um, in decision making and, if, necessarily, if necessary, during later defense of that process. And then uh, a stronger project record. eNEPA's uh, automated tracking and organization features help produce a much more comprehensive and organized project record um, for project managers. So all of that's going to lead to more efficient environmental reviews, uh, meaning faster project completion, fewer delays, um, reduced uncertainty, since all your project team members are going to have access to those, that decision-making process. Um, we expect there to be less uncertainty, not just during project development, but during later design and construction, as all of that information is going to be accessible to your project partners. And then finally, improved outcomes from that improved decision-making process. Um, kind of long-term, one of the, the long-term benefits of eNEPA, I think, is going to come from that centralized data and tracking. Um, the organization features are going to give, allow um, state DOTs and other project partners a much clearer picture and a much more detailed picture of their own processes um, and their own delay points. A lot of that information um, is, is difficult, if not impossible, to track right now. But eNEPA, um, kind of long term, as more projects are added and more users uh, are using the tool, can give you access to some of that detailed information identify what those points are, and then identify solutions, things like programmatic agreements that was a part of uh, EDC2. So um, over the last six months to a year, um, there have been some uh, changes in eNEPA. Uh, one, uh, we completed our pilot. There were originally five states who helped us with um, original testing of the tool. Um, uh, some more states joined on uh, immediately following that. Um, but as we wrapped that pilot up and moved into uh, more real projects, um, we identified uh, a new um, permanent hosting environment for the tool. We moved the tool over onto Federal Highway Administration servers, um, which is going to give us a couple of major advantages going forward. Um, obviously, there are um, kind of some enhanced security um, 
features as being part of federal highway servers, um, but kind of more importantly, um, it gives federal highway uh, complete long-term control over the tool. This means that we can continue to improve the tool in the future. Um, we can continue to identify upgrades and improvements that are going to make it more effective for your programs. Um, we've also done a lot of work to gain some uh, support from the federal resource agencies. Um, our ENIPA team has met with most of the major federal resource agencies uh, at the headquarters level and have gotten a very positive response. Um, most of the agencies are, ha are very interested in using the tool, not just on future transportation projects, um, but on some of their own projects as well. Um, Secretary Fox followed up on those meetings um, and sent a letter to uh, his equivalents at a number of uh, uh, seven of the other resource agencies voicing his support for the tool and asking their support for their field staff using the tool. Um, and we're continuing to have those meetings uh, moving forward. Um, so we've already talked a little bit uh, about uh, Secretary Fox's support for the tool. Um, He's also very supportive of the other modes using the tool. So we've started working with FTA and FRA um, to identify how we can adapt the tool a little bit to fit their programs. Um, this is going to help us uh, not just in adding users um, and not just in kind of intermodal projects, but in getting more uh, resource agencies and the other modes used to using the tool, identifying those flexibilities um, and identifying uh, new ways to use the tool um, and new projects. And then obviously, ENIP is part of Everyday Counts 3. Um, we've identified a couple of major goals going forward for the tool. Uh, one um, is just expanding the user base. Um, so our associate administrator, Gloria Shepard, sent an email uh, a couple weeks ago to the division administrators at the Federal Highway Division offices asking them to work with their DOTs to identify projects that might be good to test the tool. Um, we think this conversation is really important. Um, one, just in that the division offices are going to be part of your project team, um, so getting them on board, working with our office to get some training using the tool is going to be an important part of that process. Um, but also, you know, especially those initial projects that, um, that you use to test out the tool, selection of those projects is important. Um, we want projects that, that are going to be actively moving forward, that you're going to be able to test out the features, uh, that you're going to be able to identify, um, as we're going to talk about in a minute, improvements we want to make in the future, um, but that you and your project teams really get a chance to use these features and see how they work. Um, we know, even though ENIPA is uh, pretty easy to use, um, that in, uh, integrating a new tool into your existing processes can sometimes be a challenge. Um, so we're, we're developing training programs, uh, including live training, webinars, um, and some online resources to help ease that transition. Um, we're also continuing outreach to resource agencies. Um, I already talked that, about that a little. Um, but as we, we work through headquarters office at resource agencies, we're, we're starting to work down to the field offices to make sure that they're uh, trained and ready to use the tool um, when project managers uh, send those requests. And then finally, um, one of our, our biggest goals uh, is continuing to identify upgrades and begin implementing those upgrades. Um, so when we first started building the tool, um, I mentioned the five pilot states. We already were identifying improvements and were able to integrate those in some of the uh, earliest versions of eNEPA. Um, going forward, uh, we're developing a three-year plan for continuing those upgrades and improvements, um, which I think makes this tool um, a kind of unique uh, EDC initiative. Um, and that some of our opening speakers talked about, uh, I think Greg Nadeau's uh, speech talked about how building that culture of innovation um, is something that kind of goes beyond any individuals um, or individual programs. Um, eNEPA is one of those tools that is going to continue to develop and continue to innovate in the future. Um, and we, we really need your help in identifying what those innovations are so that um, if there's an EDC4 and eNEPA is part of that, 
um, we're going to be able to talk about the improvements um, that eNEPA has made to your programs and the improvements that we've made to eNEPA based on that feedback. Um, so to learn more, um, you can contact any members of our project team. Um, we have myself and Chip Larson at headquarters, uh, at Federal Highway headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, we have Rod Vaughn and Brian Smith in the Federal Highway Resource Center, um, and Susan Staffold who, uh, at Arkansas DOT, who was one of our um, early adopters and helped us, um, as I said, identify some of these features um, and some of the uh, training protocols that, that we talked about today. Um, so before I turn it over to our um, IQED speakers, um, we wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions um, that you might have about the tool right now. Um, Rod Vaughn and I will also be available after the session um, for anyone who'd like a, a brief demo of the tool, um, show you some of those features and kind of the look and feel. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand and um, Rod will bring you the microphone. Is this mic on? Hi, I'm Kathleen Tucker. I'm the ADOT liaison for the Corps of Engineers Regulatory. Mm -hmm. I have a couple questions. One is, so it sounds like this hasn't been fully implemented across the board? Um, it, it, it has been open for use. Um, not every state has adopted it yet. Um, but as I said, you know, we do have uh, real projects in the tool. Um, it's being used. It's being used uh, by a number of resource agencies for those projects. So it is um, fully up and running and implemented. And then my other question is, um, so once the EA EIS is finalized, you're going to construction. Mm -hmm. Does this tool follow through the project as far as um, complying with all the mitigation measures and and that is mm -hmm. there a portion of that that? Right. Well, right now the way the workflows workflows are built, they they do end with the end of the NEPA process, um, but it does help you track those commitments um, and identify when and and where they were made. Um, which I think is going to help um, in those later in that later tracking of how those are actually implemented through design and construction. Thank you. We've also talked about putting in links in eNEPA to um, other systems like the state DOT would have, which mm -hmm. one would could be the uh, mitigation electronic mitigation tracking system. So. Noel with Louisiana Department of Transportation Development. I have a question. Did, did y'all run into any issues with um, technical reports where an agency has protected data? Are they okay with um, using this? Yeah. Um, I, I think that that issue does come up um, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of these meetings that we've had. Um, eNEPA is a tool designed for collaboration among your project team. Um, so if there are certain um, documents that, that can't be shared across the project team. Um, as I said, there are some uh, ways that you can limit which members of your project team have access, but if there's information that's not part of that collaborative process that's really within um, a single agency, um, if there are conversations that wouldn't normally be held in a, in a team meeting, um, ENIPA might not necessarily be the, the best venue for those, um, but we we are definitely you know, looking for some of that feedback and ways that we can work with you to make sure we can accommodate that and make it as, as helpful as possible to your process. Have you accommodated the states uh, like California and Texas with the assignments that, uh, for NEPA? Um, we, uh, neither California nor Texas has a project in the tool right now. Um, the way that our workflows are laid out, though, they're extremely flexible um, in the way that they can be used. Um, so we, don't, we haven't foreseen any problems uh, with accommodating those. Uh, for example, your, your project member, uh, your project manager, and your project team um, aren't restricted to you know, specific agencies. Um, I know we had some conversations with uh, Illinois who wanted um, their project manager responsible for the project in, in the tool to be a contractor, um, so we can accommodate things like that as well. Um, so I think by building in those flexibilities, um, we don't expect that there's going to be a, a specific issue with uh, states that have assumed NEPA. Yes. 
Is there a tab or something for developing an administrative record in the case of lawsuits? Um, oops. Yeah. Um, when you upload a document, um, you do have the project manager does have an option to um, assign that document to the administrative record. Um, what I'd say though is that that's still a decision that's up to the project manager. Um, what the tool is meant to do is help as that decision is made, um, the project manager can select um, whether a document's included or not. And at the end of the project, um, there is a process for exporting that as a single zip file. So eNEPA as a tool does not change um, your requirements with regard to the administrative record. Um, what types of documents and conversations you might need to track if within your state there are certain um, you know, processes for how you store that data. Um, but the tool can help with kind of the administrative side of that, which is you know, assigning documents to the administrative record, um, keeping them within the tool, and then exporting them and putting them where you need to. For record retention, how long does it stay in the system? Yeah. Um, right now, document all of the project files that are in the tool um, right now are stored um, long term. We haven't identified a specific point at which it will be deleted. Um, but as part of, uh, as I mentioned, moving the tool over to federal highway servers, um, we're, we're able to um, store that very long term. Um, so. Um, we, you know, we, the information when you complete the project isn't deleted or anything, it's stored for years. Um, we haven't identified a specific point at which it'll be deleted. That, that might be a future improvement to make some kind of archive uh, right. file or Right, when, or a, when a project's completed, yeah. um, when you move sort of from the, the active to completed, all that information is archived so that you can access it again at a later date. In this uh, tool, does, is there a way for legal sufficiency to review the document as it's being developed, or is, is that at the end still? Um, there are specific points uh, in the project workflows that we've developed um, <clears throat> where uh, there are specific review steps for uh, Federal Highway to perform um, a review if, if that's necessary and for legal. Um, so essentially, as you develop your project team, you can assign individual members to be your uh, legal reviewer or your federal highway reviewer um, who would be responsible for completing the reviews at those steps. The system also uh, is set up to uh, send out emails to the uh, team members, I think when um, mm -hmm. something changes or something gets posted, you know, like review comments, so they get a notification. Okay, are there any other questions before we turn it over to our IQED team? One comment I'll make, uh, something Bill mentioned earlier, and which ties into the uh, improving the quality of environmental documents. One of the um, principles I think that uh, Dan and Owen will uh, talk about is just um, telling the story of how the uh, decision makers you know, reach their decision during the NEPA process. And it's much easier to tell that story when you have an organized process, which this tool uh, should help you to do. So. Okay, great. Um, and if you, if you think of any other questions, um, like I said, Rod and I will be around after the session's over, um, and we will have another Q&A after the, uh, the IQED presentation. Bear with us for a moment here. I get the right presentation up. There it is, excellent. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. We're gonna make a little transition here. Hopefully our screen will come up here in a moment. Good. Well, let me introduce myself. 
My name is Owen Lindauer. Uh, I work for the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Project Development and Environmental Review in Washington, D.C. I'm happy to be back here in the great American Southwest. Um, I'm one of the, uh, the pioneering members of the uh, team uh, that developed uh, the Implementing Quality Environmental Documentation as part of uh, EDC2. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a tag team presentation here with uh, my colleague Dan Johnson. Jan, will you come up and introduce yourself so that everyone can see you and you can say hello. Good morning. I'm Dan Johnson. I'm with the Resource Center Environment and Realty Technical Service Team. Um, and I've been doing NEPA for a few years. So we'll... All right. All right. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, all right. So just like Bill, we'll give you a little bit of a, uh, an outline of what we're going to try to accomplish today. Um, those of you who may not have heard of IQED, uh, we're going to give you a bit, a bit of the background history of that and, and, and the goal of this particular uh, initiative as part of EDC3. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of an orientation on what quality documentation is and what are some of the benefits of developing quality environmental documentation. We're going to provide some illustrative concepts and some examples. Uh, we're going to see if we can urge some of you out there to embrace this initiative and uh, maybe prepare for implementing it and then we'll answer any questions you have either here or, or the folks online. Okay, so um, one of the things that I think is important for I think everyone to understand is, is that this is a co very collaborative um, approach that we had to develop this initiative. Um, I don't know if it was, I don't think, I don't, because I think uh, Greg wasn't here yesterday, he didn't really have a chance to really under, underscore how collaborative uh, the, the, uh, the development of this initiative was, was, but it may be hard for you to see that at the back of the room, but our team, our IQED team, actually consists of people not only from the Federal Highway Administration's headquarters and resource center, but we also included people from AASHTO, and we have some We've had some very, very excellent input from uh, folks from the Ohio Department of Transportation and Tim Hill, uh, Carol Lee Rokvalm from the Washington, Washington State uh, DOT. And then we also have folks from the private sector, from ACEC, which is the American Council of en Engineering Co Companies. And we have several people there. Uh, Hal Kassoff was, was very, uh, has, has been a very active participant and has been provided a lot of great input. And so this really is, in, in the spirit of EDC, a, a very collaborative effort in terms of developing uh, this particular initiative of, of having, implementing quality environmental documentation. Okay, <clears throat> so moving on to what is uh, quality environmental documentation and that sort of thing. Um, state DOTs, consultants, resource agencies, we all agree that uh, we only, not only have an opportunity, but we really have an obligation to create quality environmental documents. Um, and the thing is, is, is that I think uh, people have a lot of experience developing documentation, but to really make them more readable, more understandable, and of a higher quality, we have to perhaps change some of our traditional practices or the sort of routines that we're uh, getting into and maybe break out and consider more flexible approaches and customize our approaches to develop environmental uh, documentation. And where we have seen that done, it has really been well worth the effort. Okay, so the, um, how might we benefit from this sort of thing? Well, um, the, the benefits of quali quality environmental documentation are broad-based in the sense that um, when you have a quality environmental document, you don't have to continually revise and correct sorts of things, and you don't have people who misunderstand when they're reviewing the document what the document says. So in that sense, the document itself is more efficient and effective in terms of how it delivers the information to people who have to review and read the document, or people who are interested and engaged in the project. And so in the end, Project delivery is, uh, is speeded up. It reduces the work and recommitment of resources, and particularly in the kinds of commitments of 
having to go back and redo and reformat and revise uh, documents, uh, especially long documents. Um, it improves project decision making in the way that, um, and I, uh, I'm a, uh, I have a PhD and, and I had to write a long document called dissertation and I can tell you that um, in doing that, it's, it's in, in, in some ways it's like an EIS where you have to try to get a, a series of very, sometimes very complex ideas across to some people who are very critical of what you're trying to do. And in order to do that, you have to sharpen your decision making and your, and, and your rationale in, uh, in order to get those ideas uh, across. And so in order to write a, a quality document, you really have to have your, your, your decision making and your thought processes sort of in a very rational and easy to understand sort of uh, uh, process in order to, uh, and if, if you have those, if your decision making uh, process in a way that you can explain it in a very straightforward way, especially in a document, then it will be understood in a more clear way. So in that way, uh, having something very clear and logical and well thought out is also much easier for the public to understand. Um, and of course, the quality documentation also has to address what is required by NEPA and its, and its uh, basic essentials. And then, of course, if the document uh, isn't filled with all sorts of jargon and uh, technical uh, presentations that seem to be incomprehensible to people, um, then you, perhaps you're able to uh, better establish trust and confidence in, uh, and, support, and support for the process as well as the decisions that are described in the environmental documentation. Okay, so, um, Dan, I'm going to ask you to come on up and talk about how this uh, initiative has evolved, and um, and I'll be back. <laughs> okay, so the initiative evolved. I mean, it's, it starts back with in 1977, the CEQ regulations for how to implement the NEPA process suggested some things of that documents should not be uh, not be encyclopedic. Uh, it suggested page limits, and we've we've continued to wrestle with it, and we haven't. We've made a number of attempts. In '87, FHWA issued the technical advisory on preparation of environmental documents, and it has some good things in it, uh, but it it um, it's getting a little dated. Uh, in 2006, there was this joint effort that Owen referred to. That this was the beginning of the joint effort that EDC two and three are continuing among AASHTO, ACEC, and FHWA, and it came out with a green booklet um, on improving the quality of environmental documents. There was uh, a fair amount of concern that we didn't get as far as we thought we could have or should have uh, with that, so we want to continue to uh, emphasize that, and in 2012, uh, this was selected as an EDC two initiative, and it is moving forward. So, so what's new in 2014 is um, AASHTO has issued a new practitioner's handbook for preparing high quality environmental documents uh, for transportation projects. It's very thin, uh, it fit very nicely on the plane. Uh, I was traveling light, but um, uh, what, it, what I don't have is the examples, the, the companion document to this which basically sampled a number of examples from other states uh, of um, how to how to how to implement this. Examples from other other states' EISs, and uh, there has been. Uh, this is a really great tool for states to use. It's about this thick, um, but it uh, it has really good examples uh, from a number of states, a number mm -hmm. of modes. Um, hey, Dan. Uh, I, yes. I uh, just uploaded the examples into the uh, SharePoint, Environment SharePoint site for FHWA folks. It's about 400 pages yeah. long, but it's posted yeah. in there. Thanks, Rod. Um, and, and finally, we're, we're continuing IQED into the, as part of the EDC3 initiative. Um, <clears throat> so our current goals are basically to encourage states to adopt the, the, the core principles and 
continue to work to institutionalize uh, these, these principles and commit to implementing quality environmental documents. And we'll explain that a little more. Um, <clears throat> so some of the recommendations that uh, we've come up with uh, go away from some of the traditional stuff. The traditional stuff is focusing on the document. But one of the things we wanted to point out is that it's, it's not just the document. It's the people that prepare it. And too often, we've seen examples of people who spend more time thinking about how do I put together my fantasy sports team than they do about how, are, how am I going to implement a really good quality environmental document. So you want to think about assembling a team with the requisite skills. And it is a team. It is the, it is the technical preparers. It is a technical editor. Uh, who makes sure that everything has a flow and a consistent feel, that it's understandable to the public. Uh, we look at graphic design capabilities and we look at quality control. And beyond that, we think about all members of the team and that it's, it's the consultants that prepare it. It's, the, it's either the LPA or the, the state DOT that is a, a project sponsor that is involved and they have a role in the review of this document. Um, and finally, FHWA has a role. And traditionally, we have, we have been part of the problem because typically, as reviewers, we're looking for what's not there. And we need to focus not only on what's not there, but also address what's here that doesn't need to be here. Let's cut the crap out and minimize the document, focus on what is important, uh, what are the things that the public really need to understand about this alternative, the need for this project, uh, so that they can well understand what we do. So here's the part of the problem, is that the current shape of, of environmental documents in a lot of the, a lot of the country is, is still this monstrous pyramid um, of EIS compliance, the yellow represents the size of, of most environmental documents. We have, uh, we have EISs that are, that are mountainous, and we have EAs that look like many EISs, and we sometimes have CEs that so almost resemble many EISs, but they certainly resemble EAs. Um, but we want to make sure that everyone is focused on what is necessary to be in the, in the NEPA document? Let's go back to what CEQ said about being concise and rely on appendices and technical reports. So our goal is to get to this, where the EIS document itself is the tip of the pyramid. It's relying on everything that is underneath it that is incorporated by technical reference, but uh, is easy to understand for both the public, the decision makers, and other agencies. And all of this, of course, constitutes the, the project record, but we're, we're really focused on trying to reduce the, the environmental document itself so everyone understands what are the important issues, what are the things that count, what are the things that influence this, what are the, the resources that we need to be especially careful about as we implement this project. Uh, so we, we focus on what's important. So a couple of focus areas that we're going to be looking at um, as part of EDC2 as well as ED3 um, are need and purpose statements and alternatives analysis. So we want to make sure that we are presenting problems in, and relevant facts in, in a way that it gets the reader's attention and allows it to understand what we're about. What are the desired performance standards uh, that we're looking for in our project? Uh, so that we're, we're, we're really telling the story. What is, why is, what is the need for this project? What are the issues that are driving, that should drive the selection of our alternatives? Um, while we're going through the background, the, the history, the needs, and we're providing things that help the reader, the public, understand how we reach the decision. 
Now here's an example of, of, of part of what we're looking for. We're looking for a good blend of using pictures and text together to minimize the, the amount of narrative that we provide, but making it understandable to the public. So this is from the uh, Alaska Way Viaduct in Seattle, and it talks about the viaduct and seawall vulnerabilities. And the important thing about it is that in this graphic, it shows the public a lot of the things that they can't see and, and don't understand. But what is the tan color is basically liquefied soil or liquefiable soil, soft soils, and uh, the competent soil is, is the brown stuff that's, that's way down there, and you have a, a seawall uh, to the left uh, that is basically holding all that liquefiable soil in place, uh, and uh, you have the, the piers that are supporting the, uh, the viaduct behind it. So on the, on the left-hand side, we have a few very simply stated facts. SR-99 is a critical route carrying 25% of Seattle's through traffic. So that's a lot of cars are using this. The viaduct is deteriorating and vulnerable to earthquakes. And part of the problem is the seawall is being nibbled away by gribbles. Now, elsewhere, there are pictures of what a gribble is, and it's a microscopic animal. Um, but there's, there's millions of them out there, and they're nibbling away at the seawall, and that could be a serious problem. So it's basically illustrating to the public what it can't see in very simple terms, uh, understandable terms. You know, too often we, we, we know that a picture, we, we've heard all our lives that a picture is worth a thousand words, but some pictures are worth more than others. And we need to think about the stories we're telling with our pictures. And these are some more Washington State examples from the uh, Columbia River Crossing Project. Um, Washington State's in the background and, and Oregon's in the foreground and this is over the Columbia River. And on the, on the left-hand side, we have a really good graphic of, of the issues of the pedestrian uh, and bikeway facility on the bridge. It's got human scale. You can see exactly what happens when oncoming cyclists meet each other on the bridge. Somebody's got to put their foot on the rail so the other guy can get by. That really illustrates a problem. Now, the, the, the picture in the upper right is, is pretty good. It shows congestion. You know, too often I've seen documents where they, they're preparing an environmental document, they get a photographer, they tell them to go out and take a picture of the project, and the photographer wants to take a pretty picture. They don't understand their role in this process, and they will go out on a Sunday morning when there's no cars in the road so they can get a good picture of the road. But when, you're, when a reviewer is reviewing the document and they're looking at the picture with no cars on it and they're reading in the need statement about all the traffic, they're not getting the connection. They're like, you say it's congested, but here's this picture that, that tells me something otherwise. In this picture, we see there's congestion, but we don't see the full story of that congestion. So I'm suggesting that this is, this is a good suggestion, and it's, it's helped by, by, um, by a caption in the document, but if you had a high-level oblique view, you would see that those, those vehicles aren't, aren't moving slowly. They're, in fact, stopped because right in front of the truck and the bus, um, is a lift span, and it's in the, in the upright position. Uh, it's in the raised position, so everybody stopped. And if you had a higher level view, you could see the length of the queue behind it. You could see all of the factors that are going on. Um, so this is a good attempt. It's not great. The one in the, the lower right um, gets to a really graphic presentation of the lack of seismic redundancy in a bridge in terms that the public can really understand. This is what happens if an earthquake gets a bridge that's not well equipped for it. And we need to think about really effective graphics. 
For years we've been presenting level of service and this is a, a, a different view of level of service. It has, it's, it's really clean presentation. It defines the terms of what is congestion. It's when average speed is below 30 miles an hour and it defines what a peak period is and the, the graph shows in bar form how long people are going to be stuck in traffic, whether they're going northbound or southbound, under existing conditions, and what it's going to be if we don't do anything. Terms that the public can very easily understand. So now I'm going to turn it back to Owen, our ongoing tag team. Thank you, Dan. So uh, the other focus area, in addition to uh, considering purpose and need and making the presentation of the purpose and need very high and of high, qu of high quality, is consideration and presentation of the alternatives and the analysis of alternatives. And of course, the alternatives analysis is really at the heart of uh, what the NEPA process is, particularly in an EIS. And, and here, again, our, our initiative here is really emphasizing primarily the, f the three uh, core principles. You know, tell the story. How did you reach, how did you identify these alternatives? Which al you know, how, how could you explain which alternatives are, are not going to be kept? Uh, which al and why are the alternatives that are still in play still in play? Um, keep it brief. Uh, and Dan has uh, provided some uh, ways that uh, presentation of uh, figures and all can tell the story and, what, and at the same time keep that storytelling brief and then of course meet all legal requirements. And so uh, part of the storytelling is, as I said, identifying and, uh, and clearly uh, describing each of the alternatives that are, were considered and in particular focus the attention on issues that ultimately become important on uh, which alternatives you decide to keep in play as part of reasonable alternatives and, uh, and why alternatives drop out as not reasonable and explain clearly how these decisions were made uh, and making sure that there is supporting evidence and that sort of speaks to the uh, meeting legal requirements. And then of course when there is an, uh, an opportunity to describe uh, either what alternatives are, how alternatives end up coming into or out of being play, providing clear definitions, figures, and tables that help the reader of the documentation to understand. And so the graphics really can help here. I think there's, uh, yeah, all right, so this isn't working. Okay, so um, this is difficult to see from the back room, but it's something I'm sure everyone is familiar with, their, their highway cross sections, okay? And the, uh, each of the different alternatives for this particular project uh, can be expressed in a figure that has a very different cross section. And so, um, for instance, at the top of the screen, you'll see a, uh, it looks like a, a four-lane facility divided by a central median uh, that is landscaped. Uh, the second one down, uh, is a, um, looks like it's a, a six lane cross section with, a, um, with landscaping on either side. Um, the, uh, the third one down actually uh, uh, shows a five lane cross section, but with a, um, a graphic that shows a pedestrian bridge across. Uh, and then um, the, the one on the bottom is a five lane cross section, I think with the center turn lane and that sort of thing. So it gives a sense of how how the traffic is spread across the particular um, landscape and, and, and section and, and provides um, uh, the reader some sense of where, you know, where, uh, where space allocated to cars and la landscaping and, and that sort of thing can be, uh, 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 you know, what the differences are between them. Now, um, some, la some uh, figures obviously, uh, and this isn't just limited to, um, uh, uh, alternatives aren't very helpful. And so just showing a, a plan is probably uh, going to explain everything you need to do to any engineer who is going to read the document. But to the public or maybe to other uh, uh, state or federal resource agencies is not going to make that much difference. This also may be a little difficult to see from the end of the room, but a more uh, another kind of approach to providing a figure uh, in a document might be this overlay here, which is a 
uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plan, a very simplified plan, that has been overlaid an aerial photograph. And here you can see what the alternative is. And um, it's in red. It may be difficult to see at the back of the room there. But basically, it's an interchange. And you can see how the interchange sits on the landscape and how it would impact the uh, existing uh, residential and businesses um, that are uh, already on the landscape, and so that that tells a you know a different kind of a story, and one you know that maybe um, uh, not only uh, what the alternative is, but but also very clear what the impacts of that alternative uh, might be. Okay, so uh, some of the um, concepts that we want you to uh, remember in terms of telling the story and keeping it brief with, re, uh, with regard uh, not only the purpose and need, but also the alternatives is to remember these, the, uh, the uh, core principles. Um, recognize that, uh, especially with e preparing an EIS, the format of the EIS um, is recommended in our technical advisory, but it's not required. It, the, only thing that, the only thing that really is required is meeting the CEQ requirements for the things that the particular sections that are required in in the environmental impact statement. So um, there isn't necessarily, at least from the perspective of the Federal Highway Administration, one specific template to prepare environmental documentation. Although many states have prepared recommended templates that they share with their uh, environmental document uh, contractors, um, uh, we urge people to tailor the kind of documentation to the specific project. Um, and then, of course, there are a variety of uh, approaches and tools that you should consider your environmental documentation toolbox, and, and many of those tools and examples are very well documented and available online through the AASHTO um, uh, website, through this uh, generally con general concepts in this uh, handbook, and then, of course, there's a very large, as I think Rod said, three or four hundred page set of examples that come from uh, existing uh, EIS statements and EAs that you can draw from. And then finally, um, we're, as part of this initiative, we're looking for your best practices as well. And, and, and some of those practices that became incorporated in the AASHTO um, uh, examples of uh, environmental documentation have come through this, you know, through our EDC2 initiative and that sort of thing. And so now I'm going to turn it back to Dan, uh, and he's going to tell you what some approaches are. So some of the things that we've done uh, to implement this initiative, beginning in EDC2, and it's continuing onward, now embracing the concept of eNEPA within it, um, is enhanced technical assistance and training. So we've, uh, we've done a number of, of trainings across the country. It was started a little slow, but it's really, really been building. Um, we've done uh, two-day workshops for, for Arkansas DOT and Puerto Rico uh, that basically have included uh, both the, the, the highway department uh, as well as the division office um, <clears throat> and, um, and the consultant community so that everyone's in the room and we're talking about these concepts and uh, hopefully we're, we're planting seeds so that those states can go back within that community and talk about how they can improve things. Uh, we've also done some training for um, North Carolina DOT that basically has um, a very large audience um, that included both the division and the state DOT and MPOs, but we also had representatives of the Corps of Engineers. Um, so that we were all in the room together talking about how we can implement these principles uh, in environmental documents with the cooperating agencies in the room. Um, and, you know, frankly, we had some not, uh, not heated, but certainly spirited discussions as we were reaching understandings so that we can carry these, these principles forward. Uh, we have additional engagements coming up. Uh, Rob Ayers and I will be in Wisconsin next week. Um, we've done some uh, other more limited things. These are, are flexible based on what 
a, an individual state or organization wants. So we will be, um, uh, we've, we've had many sessions for Nevada, Illinois. Um, we've done a webinar for Virginia. And, you know, I think, I think the, the, the most telling thing that we, we can say about those training sessions is we, we've already been invited back to, we're already scheduled to go back to North Carolina. Uh, we'll be going back to Arkansas next year, um, and um, uh, we'll, we're, we're working these things along. So these are working quite well. One of the other things is, is that, you know, this practitioner's handbook was based in principle on a lot of good efforts that some of the state DOTs have done in developing their own manuals for how to improve quality of environmental documents. And um, uh, Washington State, Oregon, uh, Ohio um, have, have all done initiatives on this, uh, on how they're, they're going to improve this. Um, some additional states as a part of the EDC2 initiative are working on them. Um, Massachusetts is currently working on it and we understand Louisiana uh, is, has some work in the, in the works uh, for improving their documentation. And finally, we have, um, we, we want to talk a little bit about flexible document format that, you know, there are, you can customize your approach to EISs based on a state or your region. Um, there are different ways of combining sessions, sections of your document and having those discussions that are uh, still, even though they're not uh, aligned with the, the language of the CEQ guidelines or the FHWA's technical advisory, it's recognizing that it's CEQ's guidelines, it's FHWA's technical advisory, um, the stuff has to be in there, but the order in which it's presented can be tailored based on how you tell the story for your project. So we're recognizing that flexibility. We're also recognizing that, that Congress in MAP 21 directed us to think about flexible ways of combining FEISs and RODs uh, when we've done appropriate groundwork in the early development of our project, identifying preferred alternatives. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of things that are going forward. Um, a lot of states are embracing uh, doing things in question and answer formats, basically identifying what is the questions that the public would have about the alternatives, what are the issues about the context of the project, uh, and using that, that format. And finally, we have some states that have done pilot uh, documents. And some of them have done EISs, but they, they can be done on EAs, Section 4F, uh, Purpose and Need, or Alternatives Development. And, um, and we can also provide some training in conjunction with that. Some examples of the pilot options, um, the most notable one uh, is, is from Ohio, did it on the uh, Cleveland Opportunity Corridor. And, um, uh, Tim Hill, who was at our, our first summit in D.C. a few weeks ago, basically provided a little testimonial for how that pilot worked for, for Ohio. And Tim's, Tim said the first thing that they realized of embracing the principles and incorporating them into the document was that their Ohio DOT's internal review of their own document went faster. It was a, it was a week shorter going through its own internal review. It was a week faster going through FHWA's review, and it was, it was faster going through resource agency review. So that, you know, these principles do work. It takes cultivation, it takes continual effort to make them work, but they have real opportunities for making our documents more concise. Remember that among CEQ's guidelines, the recommendation was, EAs be 15 pages. EISs be 150 pages, unless it's a really complicated project. I've seen too many 150-page CEs in my time. Um, so it's, 
we, we have opportunities uh, to do this, and we invite people to, to go forward, but we, we're, we're willing to try these pilot projects. Uh, we have been doing some work uh, in Texas, I guess, on the, uh, uh, the harbor crossing project in, in Corpus Christi. Uh, so that's one of the, the local examples of where we're trying to uh, provide enhanced technical assistance in reviewing the, the document. So for your NEPA documents, we want to we want to personalize this and internalize this somewhat and ask ourselves, can the public read them? Can they make sense out of it? Uh, is this document useful and effective? And, you know, are the participating agencies and cooperating agencies in agreement? Because if, if they're not on board, uh, we, we haven't been fully successful. So I'm glad we have at least one uh, core liaison in the room um, as we've had at most of these sessions, and it, uh, we, we want to make sure that they're, they're comfortable and understand this initiative as well, because it won't be successful if we don't do it. And finally, we want to make sure that we've addressed all the compliance issues that are, that are always there. Um, and finally, is the document legally sufficient? And one of the candid questions that one of our people, uh, uh, one of the state representatives asked us, are FHWA's lawyers on board with this? Yes, they are. Uh, some of them are still kicking and screaming, but we're, we're dragging them. This is our initiative. This is Everyday Counts initiative, and they are participating in this. Okay, so finally, you wanna ask yourself, how have we improved the quality in our states? What have we tried? What are the things that we've done? Um, what do you, what, what are the barriers, concerns, or constraints that, that you've encountered? Um, have this conversation and find out what will work for your area. So uh, we're getting to the point where we're going to open it up for questions, but one of the other things I want to sort of emphasize, some of the things that Dan had said, if you're considering this might be an initiative for you, you don't you don't need to have an EIS that you're about to begin. This is an initiative that can be applied to an ongoing EIS. Uh, the Harbor Bridge Project in uh, Corpus Christi that Dan, Dan mentioned, they decided they had, they had been working on a, uh, a draft EIS for about four years and hadn't quite got it done. And they asked us, it was getting to be quite a lengthy document and they asked, they asked me, because uh, I'm, the fellow who deals with Texas projects to help them out with that. And so they had a good experience with that. Um, there was a project up in, um, uh, in Montana, Billings Bypass, a project that had been around for, oh, I don't know, about seven years or so. And uh, they decided that they wanted to have a reader-friendly EIS summary, okay? So in other words, the, the summary, as you probably, if you know anything about EISs and if you've read any, it's probably the one piece of an EIS that everyone reads because it summarizes the whole EIS. Well, they wanted to make that even more clear and reader friendly. And what they ended up doing is, is, is uh, sort of created this idea of, you know, maybe this, this summary could be useful um, to the public on, as a standalone um, um, object uh, to distribute during the, uh, the public hearing and that sort of thing. And in fact, that, that kind of an idea was, was applied in the uh, Harbor Bridge project. Um, and uh, our team has recently developed a template uh, for a reader-friendly EIS summary, which we'll be rolling out um, in the next uh, couple of months. Um, some other examples, um, there is all sorts of environmental documentation that could you know, stand to have the principles of, you know, tell the story, keep it brief, let it meet all the environment, the uh, particular legal uh, requirements. Uh, for instance, a, 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 a Section 4F evaluation, which you might have to develop for any class of document, e, uh, CEEA or EIS, those uh, might be something that you'd be interested in. So we encourage you to, um, to think broadly, and it's certainly this has been a very useful initiative. And of course, um, we're interested to hear what your best practices are as well, what has worked and what maybe doesn't work so well. And so with that, 
uh, I'm going to show you a very large uh, EIS here. <laughs> and uh, I'll ask you, uh, are there any questions? And Dan can come up here, too, and, and two of us uh, would be happy to field any questions. Any questions on, from online, uh, Rod, or did you notice? I haven't seen any. OK. Well, um, this is uh, Dan and my contact information. You're, you're welcome to call or, or send us an email. Um, there's a URL there at the bottom of the screen um, that you can click on and, and read uh, about some of the, uh, the successes that our initiative has already achieved over the last few years. And uh, we hope to continue with that. Um, uh, Dan, anything, any uh, parting shots or experiences that you want to, or do you want to do some marketing from some of your training that you, that you have? Uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, one thing I'll say, especially to uh, FHWA folks and those who are um, watching the broadcast, if you have um, good examples of uh, um, efforts to improve quality, uh, please send them to us. Uh, Colorado, um, a couple months ago, sent some uh, EA templates that they had uh, worked on with uh, Colorado DOT and uh, we were able to share those with um, other parts of the country as uh, potential tools to use. So send us those good examples. Kathleen Tucker again. I think um, in reviewing uh, Arizona's documents, uh, one of the hardest sections is purpose and need because it, it gets so long and so convoluted that I, I lose information while I'm going through it. So to have that that part of the document in a more user friendly, you know, plain language um, would be very helpful. And also um, in Arizona, we don't require um, our, pros our process for permitting be concurrent with um, an EIS or an EA, but it would be helpful to have um, a conceptual idea on plans or somewhere in the document of where our resources are, waters of the U.S., that would help um, clarify kind of what's going on with them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh. But that's, it, 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 you touch on one thing that we really want to emphasize that we feel is very important is that uh, we've had the, the opportunity of participation from uh, the core at, at several levels at these summits, um, but generally, well, in, in Arlington, it was uh, our, our headquarters liaison. Um, but you know, really, this comes down to because each each division in each state deals with one or more core districts. We need to engage the core districts as part of that conversation. So we need to have that top-down and bottom-up conversation to make sure that we're successful. Yeah, Lauren Diaz actually put the word out and the district engineer said, you need to go to this, so <laughs> that's why I'm here. I, I was, in, in terms of your comment about um, resources of concern to particular federal agencies, this is a very common situation. And it's one that um, I think needs to be sort of focused and, and considered uh, because there, um, one of the things we're trying to do in this initiative is to identify the key aspects of what decision making and what what you know what what is important in terms of what is driving the project, the story of the project, what why why are decisions being made in the way they are, and that sort of thing. And the decisions for the project, uh, and especially the big decisions, may not be the same decisions that the other resource agencies have. And and the point is and. The example from the Corps of Engineers is a good one in the sense that you suggested 
could there be a figure that shows all of the you know, jurisdictional wetlands? Well, not, speaking very generally, I would say that's absolutely appropriate. Does it need to be in the document would be a question I would ask. Uh, does it, could it be just in the project record? Remember that pyramid that, mm -hmm. you know, that Dan had where uh, our old traditional um, method is let's, 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 as a project team member, let's make sure that our resource agencies are content in our preparation of the project. And so we'll just, they want, they want jurisdictional maps uh, for wetlands in there, we'll just throw it in there, you know, either in the chapter or in the appendix or something like that. What we're saying is, is that we need to have a discussion uh, amongst the joint lead agencies and the participating agencies to figure out, well, you know, sure, we're going to look at the jurisdictional max. We'll have them in the project record. We'll assure ourselves that they are, in fact, you know, properly, you know, bounded and that sort of thing. But do they need to be in the document sort of thing is, is the question we would ask. Um, and, you know, certainly I used a number of examples from the Columbia River Crossing Project, which had some really good examples of how to illustrate a lot of stuff. Um, I didn't use them all, uh, but, but they had a, a really good graphic showing navigational channels issues um, for where the, uh, where the uh, uh, lift bridge uh, or the, where, the, where the main shipping channel was in relation to uh, the piers, et cetera. And all of that was very important, but in the, in the final analysis in that project, they had a turnover uh, during the um, late in the project of, of a reviewer from uh, the Coast Guard and the navigational issues in the channel turned out not to be the main issue for the new reviewer for the Coast Guard. He was worried more about elevation issues. And if any of you know, know Portland and, and, and Vancouver, Washington and, and the location of this bridge, it's very close to SeaTac Airport, and there are glide path issues uh, that conflict with the height of the bridge. So the Coast Guard's saying, raise the bridge up, and we're like, no, we've got another issue that you've got to understand, and we hadn't shown that in the document. And there's, you could pretty easily show that graphically. Uh, so we, we, we all have opportunities to continue to, to tell the story well. My other, I'm sorry, I had one more comment about <laughs> the documentation, like during the alternative screening and trying to map out resources. And I've run across this, I, I know specifically a couple times, is they're looking at waters in relation to, to me, engineering, floodplains, and those types of things, as opposed to the resources and how we define them. So I'll look at something and it's like, okay, you've documented flood pains and this, but you haven't really addressed the other uses of those, of that resource, so. Okay. Yeah, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, Steve Cook, uh, Nevada DOT. I was wondering if both of you could speak to how the public's respond to this process, because I know in the past, uh, more so dealing with environmental impact statements at, at the public hearing, people will want to see the document. And a lot of people just want to see it for the sake of knowing it exists. And for them, the thicker it is, the more comfortable they feel because then they think, oh, it was very comprehensive, it's very inclusive, and I feel comfortable with the project. Now, if we skinny that down, they're going to see it and say, oh my gosh, what, did they, what have they done or what haven't they covered? And we, we, we just completed a, an EIS not too long ago, and it was very concise, and it was very thin, and I, I loved it. I mean, we, we worked to get it to that point, but I'm not so sure the public, I, I guess the real question is, how do you sell this to the public? Uh, that's an excellent question. I, I'll give an example in the opposite direction. I worked on an EIS a number of years ago, a highly controversial project in the D.C. metropolitan area there, it had been two previous draft EISs, the project had never gotten to a final. And when we finally started to move it forward, uh, this was about 2002, and um, the Alaska Way Viaduct was the hot thing then, and the, the, the um, 
we were aware of the green booklet and I had suggested to the project team that we adopt some of those principles and the lawyers were tapping me on the shoulder saying, you realize you just put out two previous EISs that look like this and if you put something out like this, the public will say you haven't done that. You know, you're just whitewashing the thing. You're, you're not doing the full analysis and you know, you're just doing a sham job on us. Uh, so we ended up doing a document like this. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the record of decision for that project was about 100, 148 pages, I think. Um, not, not, not a good standard. I mean, it was a complex project, but um, when, when you think about CEQ suggesting 150 to 300 pages, we missed the mark. Yeah. But the, the, the interesting story was the, the lawyers were exactly correct that the, the ultimate plaintiffs of the project first, first objection when we announced we were starting this project, and it was under the executive order for streamlining, uh, was they're going to shortcut the process. They're not going to show everything. Um, but then when we produced this big document, and unfortunately we put it out just about this time of year, it was like, look at this big document they put out. We, can't, we don't have time to digest it, and they're going to ruin our holidays. And I think the, the important thing that, that this document and the examples book so, uh, provides really good examples of how to use indexes to show where the technical information is. And a lot of, a lot of states and DOTs are now putting the technical information on CDs or DVDs that are, they're attaching in the back of the document. If you provide a paper copy of the, the index of what's in that that disk. Uh, they don't have to play Karnak. They know what's what's in there. Um, and they're, I, I think that's a good opportunity to show the public uh, where they could find the information if they really wanted to dive into it. And they know that, uh, they have the opportunity to know that it's, it's not a lightweight presentation. And, and what I would say, I'll give you a, I'll give you a modern example that has a hopefully we'll have a happy ending. <laughs> the, the Harbor Bridge project, as you can, I mean, looking at, looking, at, uh, looking at Dan and I up here, you can see, you know, we're old guys, we're gray, and we're not the young generation. And what happens is the people who are one or two generations younger than us aren't necessarily expecting a big fat stack of papers. They're more comfortable reading documentation online. And so for the Harbor Bridge Project in Texas, the Texas Department of Transportation has a fabulous website for that project. And they have a whole tab on environmental documentation. And so, they ha so if you are uh, you know, an environmental impact freak kind of a person, someone who really loves to get into that, de I shouldn't say freak, sorry, excuse me. Someone who is really passionate about those details. Enthusiastic. <laughs> Enthusiastic. Um, then, um, then they can get into those technical reports to whatever degree of detail they want. They're available at any time, you know, uh, uh, that you want. And, and yet, uh, as Dan was saying, the, the FEIS or the draft EIS is actually a more manageable document because it really is there just telling the story and trying to keep the thing brief. And so ultimately, I think, I think we have to think about what our public is actually expecting in various ways. And, and I think Dan is right in the sense that we don't want to give the impression by having a brief story that we're not, we're not doing what we need to do, we're not taking the hard look, we're not sort of satisfying our legal and, uh, and practical obligations for consideration of project impacts and, 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 making, and disclosing how we reach decisions within the NEPA process. But I think we can do it in a more efficient way uh, by using technology, by thinking carefully about how we tell the story using maps and tables and figures and things like that. Hi, Deb Perkins Smith from Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, Rod had just mentioned our template um, that we've just provided as an example. So we had two EAs recently that we put through this template process and the public loved them. Um, very short and concise. I would say the document was 75% shorter 
than what we would normally produce. Um, and it did have a lot of the technical appendices on CDs for those that were interested. Um, but the, the agencies actually liked it even better. So it was a really good experience for us. Um, and I think that's, that's what they're going to expect in the future. Um, we actually tested it out on two that only had a, that either had a PEL or only had one alternative. And I think that is much easier than something, say, that has multiple alternatives. So we did start with something that was maybe a little bit easier, although one was very, very controversial. So, and they were long quarters, one of them. <laughs> yeah, those uh, templates uh, made good use of graphics as well as uh, a lot of tables, you know, kind of summarizing information in a little bit more visually pleasing format. Yeah, I was going to say, there, there's, um, in the examples document that, that Ashto put out, um, there are some really great examples of, of some need and purpose uh, data on the, I think, the I-70 corridor. Um, and they're, they're really, really good graphics. Uh, I really encourage you to look at them because they really demonstrate a, a broad range of issues on the need and purpose of the project. Where, where the traffic's coming from, what's, what's generating it, where the problems are from a safety standpoint, where are the congestion issues. Uh, it's, it's, it's really well, well done. And, and I would just respond in terms of the, what you said about alternatives. That's, you've encapsulated the issue for EISs in a very nice way. If, if you don't, if you only have a, a um, basically a preferred or a, uh, basically a proposal for an alternative like you would have in an EA, then your job is that a lot much easier because you're just making the comparison with the no-build. Uh, obviously, in, in the EIS, you have to demonstrate that you're looking at all the reasonable alternatives. And you have to sort of describe how you reach this idea that they are reasonable in the first place and, and why did you discard the other alternatives as not being reasonable. And so the way to tell that story you can tell that story in a very long and lengthy and pedantic way. You can, you can use uh, tables and figures and, and graphs to sort of compare and contrast alternatives. I mean, even after you get to the point of identifying the reasonable alternatives, how do you define the one that is preferred? Uh, those, are, those are techniques that we're really interested in learning more about how people in the, in the field in different states are actually doing and which ones really work well and which ones maybe don't work so well. Roger Sirdal with Federal Highway, Central Federal Lands. I want to help sell this message. And each one of you have used the three core principles. I just want to clarify my understanding of that. Tell the story, keep it concise, ensure legal sufficiency. Is that correct? That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We have t-shirts for sale after the meeting. <laughs> I just want to make about a comment about uh, my position and, and with the DOT and it, the reason this happened is because they took away our stamp machine at the core so we couldn't mail anything out anymore. <laughs> so we do all electronic submittals. They send me, their, some of them still feel like they have to send me a hard copy or a CD but I, by preference for me now and I'll print out what I want is everything electronic. It gets to me faster and so that cuts time in the review process but with all the you know NEPA documents and, and everything that needs to be sent to me, the permitting and all that, it, it's, I'm trying to be 100% electronic which is, again, that cuts time off your, your process, and it works very well. Nobody's requested hard copy, which is nice, even though we do have a stamp machine again. <laughs> Thank you. An excellent unsolicited testimonial for eNEPA. Um, but, but, but seriously, I, th I think, you know, sometimes we don't realize how fast technology is overtaking us. Um, in 2002, Maryland did a EIS uh, on one of their corridors, fairly long corridor, and we decided when we put the draft EIS out that was about yay thick, um, they gave the public an option. 
you, you, can, you can have paper or plastic. You can either get a, a paper document or you can get a CD uh, that contains the same information. 75 requests came in, and the only people who requested the paper copies were the politicians. Everybody else wanted, wanted the plastic version. Uh, a few people wanted uh, the printed tables or the, the printed uh, plan sheets, but they wanted the rest of the information on, on, the, on the plastic version. Yeah, which, which, which reminds us that we need to, as technology advances, we may need to revisit our documented and approved public involvement plans, make sure they're up to date accordingly. But um, yeah, and I was I was actually going to go off on that. I think we have to realize that the, you know we're in an age where more and more people can and do want to review information digitally, uh, but there are. We saw, you know, because we are public servants, we have to also be cognizant of the fact that there may be some people either through preference or other kinds of handicap that can't access that information. And so we have to be aware of providing that information in alternative terms. So I would just say that. So that's all part of this sort of experience that we're trying to gather in best practices as well. All right, uh, do we have any questions for Bill? Um, you, again, we'll have a, a computer set up up front for uh, anybody that wants to look at a demo. We have a question. Okay. <laughs> Deb Perkins Smith again from CDOT. Um, so I did have a question on ENIPA. I just happened to think of this during the presentation. We're talking about legal sufficiency. Um, was there a distinction when the agencies provided comments between, because we have this, between official comments and when you're just kind of working through something and it's not an official comment yet, how did the system handle that? Right. Um, ENIPA does not uh, allow, allow you to differentiate those comments except for the, the project manager's decision in compiling the administrative record. Um, so again, it, it, it does allow you to sort of flag what things are gonna be part of that administrative record, um, but just like now, you know, making that decision is still up to the project manager. So when the comments came in, did sometimes they attach a um, formal letter mm -hmm. as part of that comment? Okay, and then in other cases, did they not provide that formal letter at all and provided a comment and said that sufficed for their official comment? Right, that's, that's up to the agency and the project manager how they how they're going to manage that part of the process. Okay. Steve Cook from NDOT. Uh, Bill, I was wondering with eNEPA, is it set up to uh, address reevaluations or supplemental EISs? Um, yeah, when you get to that stage in the process, um, if you need a reevaluation or uh, an SEIS, there is an option to, to include that. Okay, thank you. Okay, if that's all the questions, again, uh, Rod and I will be around if you'd like uh, an additional demonstration of eNEPA. Um, and I think Dan and Owen will be around if you have any other IQED questions. But uh, I think that'll be it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>